Um, welcome to today's seminar, seminar in um, uh, the professionalism series. Um, we are delighted and honored uh, to have with us uh, Professor Rosemary Stevens. Um, uh, Professor Ro Stevens uh, is the DeWitt Wallace Distinguished Scholar uh, in the Department of Psychiatry at the Weill Cornell Medical College. Um, for many years, uh, as many of you know, uh, Professor Stevens was at the University of Pennsylvania uh, as the Stanley Scher Professor in Arts and Sciences in that great department uh, of history and sociology of science at Penn. Uh, in fact, Dr. Stevens, Professor Stevens, uh, chaired that department uh, during her stay at, at Penn. Uh, also during her stay at Penn, uh, Professor Stevens served as the Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Professor Stevens is a distinguished uh, scholar uh, in the history of um, health care and health policy. Um, uh, she's published uh, uh, seven or eight books. Uh, some that you may know or remember include American Medicine and the Public Interest, um, the, the book on welfare medicine in America, a case study of Medicaid, um, a uh, book that I was thumbing through yesterday, In Sickness and in Wealth, American Hospitals in the 20th Century, and more recently, um, a book entitled The Public-Private Healthcare State, Essays on the History of American Health Policy. Um, Professor Stevens, I know, is currently working on a new book, um, and in fact, uh, I appreciate very much that she was able to take the time out from that project to come join us today. Uh, the talk today will be on the limits of professionalism, historical perspectives. Welcome to Chicago. Thank you. You don't say no to Dr. Siegler. <laughs> I am going to give this presentation sitting down, so some of you may not be able to see me I'm going to try to project so you can all hear me, but please tell me if you can't, right? Feel free to stand up and make sure I'm still here if, if you can't see me. Um, and uh, I'm going to run through uh, some slides fairly fast. Liz, you have a copy of the slides, uh, and anybody who would like a copy is very, uh, is very welcome to ask for one afterwards. So. Here I am, now I sit. So I started thinking about this, uh, this talk with the question, what will future historians say about 2012 when professionalism is included as an item for instruction and evaluation in medical school and residency programs? Shouldn't it be the overarching value for everything else? Well, of course it should. So we immediately start by two meanings of the word professionalism. And here, for example, this is the American Board of Medical Specialties, a maintenance of certification, meaning everybody has to, who gets the board certificate, certificate has to maintain it, the ACGME, teaches and evaluates in these areas, his professionalism, one of six competences. That's, that is weird, <laughs> isn't it? And here is systems-based practice. You, you, you're probably familiar, many of you are familiar with all of this. So it's, it's, it's an oddity in history that we've divided out professionalism and sometimes as, as a subject to be taught and evaluated separate from other things. And sometimes this, 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 is, this goes a little far. This is a little bit unfair to hospitalists. I'm a fan of hospitalists. But this is just to show you the title, Core Competences in Hospital Medicine from 2006. Can you find professionalism and medical ethics? Well, obviously, sitting in the back, you can't read this. But <laughs> the point is, the point is, it's right down here. Oh, yes. That little line says, professionalism and medical ethics. I see it. You see? 
uh, under clinical conditions, procedures, healthcare systems. These are all chapters of the core competencies in hospital medicine. As there were struggles to try and define what these were uh, in 2006, they may not be the same now, but the point I'm making is why do we take, why has professionalism become a topic? I mean, a, a, a narrowly based topic with its own rules. So if professionalism is so important, it has to be taught. Why has it simultaneously first become more visible, as in this seminar series, and at the same time, it's shrunk? Now, I've, I've been working as a professional historian now for many, many years. But I've also done inadvertent field work in that I have, since, ni since the early 1970s, I've served as a public member on, a, on a, a range of different medical professional organizations. So these include the National Board of Medical Examiners, the American Board of Pediatrics, the ECFMG, uh, and the American, well, m most recently, the American Board of Medical Specialties. So I've lived through some of these debates about professionalism as something to be considered within the profession. Being a public member is another subject which uh, is, is well worth a talk by somebody, but uh, I'll just make one brief comment about this. When somebody asks you, what does the public think? <laughs> you don't look surprised and amazed and wondering whether this is a philosophical question <laughs> or a question of poll taking. You, you say whatever you like. <laughs> I want to muse here about medical professionalism with reference to some historical examples, uh, idiosyncratically selected historical examples, which as you will see, better, which as you will see uh, focus mostly on the 1920s and 30s for a reason. I'm working on the 1920s now in my current, uh, in my current research. I also want to bring, uh, to, to remind us right here as we, as we get going, on uh, some underlying assumptions or themes. In the parallel to the moaning and groaning that seems to be going on as to what a hard time the medical profession is having in terms of, of, of current pressures today, I want us to start by taking an open mind and accepting that things are actually no better or worse than they've ever been. In, in fact, in many ways, they're much better. Think what doctors can now do, which they couldn't do 50 years ago, 10 years ago even. And the thinking about context-dependent professionalism, obviously there isn't something called professionalism which is the same wherever you are, although I'm sure that's debatable. Um, and that there are a number of different meanings of what it is, as you've been through, I'm sure, in these, in these sessions. It is impossible to fulfill all the expectations that have been of professionalism that have been raised over time. And that it follows that professionalism as a concept has both multiple definitions but also multiple limits. So my topic is about limits. All right, so much for the mindset. Are you all with me so far? So much for the mindset. So I want to select, these are what I've called select sections. Oh, this is nice. Somebody else did these slides for me. <laughs> uh, so we'll begin by, by, by taking an older uh, assumptions about professionalism, that if, that if you belong to a professional class, you have natural ways of dealing with your life, natural forms of manner learned, obviously, but you have certain, certain behaviors which the public can take, can take for granted. Then, uh, but that's not enough. So here's another one defining professionalism through education and credentials, which is all of these credentialing kind of boards. And the third is the more recent um, emphasis on competence as professionalism with the competencies, but also thinking about competence as an absolutely key uh, uh, part of being a doctor. 
it's not enough to, uh, to, to behave like a doctor, it's not enough to be trained like a doctor, um, you have to be competent as a doctor, and all of these are in the wider versions of professionalism, or ought to be. So let's first uh, begin with, uh, and then I'm going to have a little brief conclusion. So let's first begin with professionalism as an attribute of belonging to a professional class. Um, while this title may sound like a truism, obviously um, you are a professional because you belong to a profession. But nevertheless, in the early 20th century, an array of professions sprang up and, or emerged or were, or, were, um, uh, or were strengthened, including medicine, um, law, theology, engineering, architecture, journalism, nursing, physical therapy, many, many others. And they, they offered, the profession seemed to offer the prospect of having a stable professional class which would play a very important ethical role uh, and policy role, really, in society. Um, collectively, the professions might be seen as ordered, educated, trusted communities imbued with progressive idealism. And they're institutions, too. So this is a, a quote I really like. This is from the, the book um, In Sickness and in Wealth. It's a quote about hospitals as ideal institutions, just to give you the flavor of, uh, of, the, of the rhetoric on the idealistic side of the equation. Cities on a hill, cathedrals, shrines, places which exclude bickering. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, but the ideal is a place where everybody works quietly together, effectively together, do, does not argue. And uh, these, these kinds of things right at the bottom, the good feelings, engendering good feelings. And you might, even be you, you might even be willing to die for the ideals of your profession or your, or your institution, if necessary. This is kind of the kind of rhetoric we don't have today, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it was very important as a while, and it was part of the, the idea of a class being imbued by certain moral values. So the sense, the sense that the professions were essential to balance out the evils of a capitalist democracy when were, were, were very much clear in the, in the 1920s. Here, this, this I thought you might like. This is Calvin Coolidge's famous and much used quotation, the business of America is business. He didn't actually say that exactly. He said the chief business of the American people is business. And then he went on to say the chief ideal of America is ideals. It doesn't quite have the public relations and zing, does it, yeah. of the business of America is business. But, but, but I, I put this up to show you that, that there are these two ideas, the moral values of professionalism and not-for-profit institutions and other, uh, uh, other activities. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't include religion specifically. And uh, set against the dirt, the clamor, the business orientation of, uh, of American capitalism in the 20th century and since. Well, obviously, the idea that professions and all, all of their members are pure in heart, working selflessly for the good 24 hours a day, is comforting. But it defies credulity. People then were no different from people are <coughs> now. And however pure in heart, private practitioners and hospitals have long been entrepreneurs themselves, and sometimes myths, these kinds of myths get in the way. But I don't think it was, it was really believed, in the, even in the 1920s, that belonging to a professional class was enough. Was something spe special to be expected of this new class of professionals? And there was a, a, a conference in Detroit in 1919 which raised this question of what is the duty of professionals in society? Included architects, chemists, many, many others, and doctors. And, and talked about the interrelationships of professions. However, it was immediately clear at the conference, something that would have been clear to anybody here, 
that each profession fought for itself, wary of encroachment from any others, and uninterested in a social in agenda, whether you were an architect who was, who was uninterested in cleaning up the slums of the time, or whether you were a doctor in, who, who theoretically was interested in, in ensuring that all members of society needed medical care. And, I, and here is a nice little cry. What is a profession, said, the, the, said one of the speakers in this conference. Same cry we have right now. What is a profession? Who knows? No longer the same as it, as, as, as it used to be, or we think it should be. And so these are old ideas, uh, uh, but in diff very, different, uh, very different kind of settings. From that time on, from the 20s on, there's been an imputed public ethic, ethos of public service by professions, but it has been a fuzzy commitment with substantial limits to it. Where a major profession has been involved in public uh, policy, it has been only too easy for its leaders to be put down for pushing an agenda in the profession's self-interest, or for its members, the profession's members, to object because their professional organizations are taking a position they don't necessarily adhe all adhere to, or both at once. And you think of, well, economists, uh, you, maybe economists associate themselves as experts on the economy. Uh, physicians are not the same, don't make the same claim as experts on the medical system. And indeed, if we jump from the, his, from the history of the 20s to the near present, the most interesting example was to, was to, of trying to get these, um, uh, these public and private interests into some kind of sync was the, the physician charter, of which you're probably all aware, um, which came out now 10 years ago. And it has a blog. It has actually a very interesting blog but the blog is talking about more narrow issues of profession, professionalism rather than, um, rather than how to develop systems uh, and uh, how to commit to the three fundamental principles that are stated here, the primacy of pa patient welfare, patient autonomy, and social justice. Perhaps the Charter's primary value has been to turn to has been its strong signal of support for redefining professionalism in terms that recognize major environmental shifts, such as uh, patient welfare in, in modern conditions, patient autonomy in the current in the current system, and social justice given the economic system of, of medical care. So then we, we get the refocus on consumerism, quality measurement, health information technology, cost control, teamwork, ethical dilemmas, uh, legal and payment issues, and the need for organizational improvements and more, the kinds of, of questions that, that are very practical and very acute uh, questions today. A rather different assumption about a profession as a social class has been the equation of of that class, an educated upper class, with manners and etiquette. I can't resist giving you, I'll come back to this in a minute. This is Emily Post. <laughs> and she wrote in 1922 a book called Etiquette, 22, in Society, in Business, in Politics, and at Home. And. Uh, uh, you won't be able to read this, but anyone who wants to read all the details can, uh, can get a copy of the slides. But very briefly, she discusses, among other things, that manners are a hallmark of, of civilization. They, then they kind of wrapped into ethical behavior. They, they're part of morals, the moral duty people have. That there's a code of honor. She talks about the gentleman, but uh, there were a lot of very spunky working women in the 1920s, and uh, uh, this would include the honor of, of the gentle woman as well, um, the inviability, probity, incorruptibly, and so forth. Making a good impression, this is still with us, 
she's using a business uh, thing. If you enter a man's office and he's got his feet up on the table, you don't think he can be a very competent businessman. Well, that's, that's, a, that's sort of parallel to if you enter a doctor's office and the doctor is on his cell phone or looking at his computer, you wonder how competent that physician actually is with respect to you. So some of these, these things, I mean, this is a very interesting book, actually, to read in a current con uh, context. And she also makes the point that you have to learn to project. And at the bottom, you which says, unconsciousness of self, that you have to project yourself to be unconscious in the moment of yourself, not so much because of unselfishness as having the mental ability to extinguish all thoughts of yourself exactly as you turn out the light and then you come back, which is, which is what doctors do when turning patients over very quickly, concentrating totally, and then coming back to, one, to oneself after. What I'm trying to, to tell you, of course, is that nothing is new that we're looking at today in many of these issues. I looked up Emily Post it, it just on Google, uh, and you may be interested to know the Emily Post Institute in Vermont still teaches business etiquette, a vital piece of a professional success puzzle. Incivility in the workplace is rampant. That's what this, the website says. I just leave it at that. Uh, and more, what's more, incivility in the workplace, which comes up to questions of cooperation, working with other professions, communication, handoffs, all sorts of things. Incivility in the workplace negatively impacts productivity, as well as behavior among those working for you, for an uncivil su superior. The point is that etiquette, manners, whatever you want to call them, etiquette, professional etiquette, affects both quality and costs of, of the professional services you are given. And that is obviously true in healthcare. How uh, physicians behave, uh, how they behave with their team, how far the team is all working as a group, uh, how far physicians are willing to listen, and so forth, uh, clearly affects the, the health, the total amount of health care that has been given inside hospitals and outside, something which does affect quality and cost and perhaps hasn't been uh, uh, emphasized enough in our current context. You remember the old saw, manners maketh money, right? Here's Emily again. Now, but of course, there are limits to manners. I mean, in etiquette. Uh, we all have heard about people who can talk the talk, walk the walk, but aren't necessarily very good clinicians uh, or, uh, or, giving, or giving appropriate care. So, and this was true also again in the 1920s. There's a wonderful book. This is a quote, long quote from Babbitt, a book by uh, Upton Sinclair, S Sinclair, Sinclair Lewis. Lewis, sorry, uh, by Sinclair Lewis, which came out in 1922, the same year that Emily Post was writing. And Babbitt is, is your, your middle class, upwardly mobile guy in a, in, a, in a fictional city in the Midwest who's, who's, who's making it. And uh, and Babbitt is a real, real tour. And Babbitt can talk the talk of professionalism. So he's driving upwards in this city of Zenith. And he w uses words like unselfish, unselfish service. Se se uh, service. He uses phrases like a servant of society. He uses phrases, he, there's a thing like ethics, he says, in a parody of the, of the language of professionalism. Um, there's a thing like called ethics whose nature was confusing, but if you had it, you were a high-class realtor, and if you hadn't, you were a shyster, a piker, and a fly-by-night. These virtues awakened confidence in clients and enabled you to ha handle bigger propositions, but they didn't imply you had to be 
that you had to be impractical. In other words, you could still sell a property which wasn't worth anything. So he was talking the talk without uh, walking the walk. And so talking and, and behaving is obviously not enough. So then other people were talking about professions uh, in the 20s and 30s. And some of these you may also have, 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 have read. But I think these messages are, are useful because the medical profession has over time been noticeably unwilling to recognize other health professions, for example, as of equal status to, their, to the medical profession. Do, not necessarily equal authority, but equal status to the medical profession. And there is a more of an agenda to be worked out there. Many of us have been in hospitals where you go into a patient's room and there's a, there's a board and it says, your, your nurse today is somebody, is Joy. Your RN today is Joy. Your uh, nursing assistant is somebody else, first name. And it either says your doctor is doctor somebody or it doesn't tell you who your doctor is at all. And that's, that's really not teamwork, right? It's not even Emily Post's etiquette. So let's jump on a minute to another, writer, another set of writers on professions. This is a classic book. It's actually an English book by two writers, Carr Saunders and Wilson, which came out somewhat later in 1933. And they write, they, they really, it's really a sociological book about professions and the rise, the really rapid rise of professions in the 20th century in the first few decades of the, of the 20th century. Saunders and Wilson also recognized the professions as what they called anchors of society. But they were more realistic in, in many ways than previous documents had been by acknowledging that fee-for-service fee -service professions were apathetic about providing for the needs of people with whom they were not personally confronted. Right? In other words, they didn't have necessarily effective, broader community or, uh, or social goals. And we might say the same today. Uh, and this book, coming out in the 30s, saw socialization, in other words, government intervention, as the way in which health care would be provided. So professional men are not philanthropists. Again, please add women, are not philanthropists. They ask for a decent living in return for the services they perform. That is, in, in, in some respects, a more uh, realistic view of, uh, of what a profession uh, was, and to some extent still is. But um, the, the dialogue, again, has been a continuing one uh, as to how far beyond these limits does one go. I think current concerns about the decline in real income of professions, of physicians, of physicians has added anxiety to concern about professionalism uh, in, la in the last few years by questioning the social standing of the physician in the 21st century. So some of these issues of social status and professional as a part of, of professionalism have lingered. You know, who am I? Do I have respect? Whose respect do I have? Where do I stand in the social hierarchy? And the whole, all of the questions of behaving like a professional are still clearly with us. But neither of these uh, elements is enough to signify professionalism writ large. You can have good, side bed, good bedside manner, but atrocious skills. <coughs> so now we turn to uh, uh, my second, well, I've called it a section because I wanted to give the illusion that this was very, very carefully structured as a talk, <laughs> when it, it is in fact musings. This long piece shows you that in 1901 the AMA became reorganized. You go down through uh, the Flexner Report in 1910, it's followed very rapidly by the American College of Surgeons, the National Board of Medical Examiners, and then some of the American specialty <laughs> boards uh, in the uh, between 1917 
1933, which is, when this, which is when I start this slide. So you can see there's a great rise of professional organizations in American medicine in the first third of the 20th century uh, with a very strong message to uh, focus professionalism on standardizing education, professional education, and providing nationally recognized or state recognized credentials. You've, you've been through all of this probably in, uh, in other I'm, I'm talks. I'm just looking at Dr. Winnie who talked about the origins of, of the American Medical Association, um, mm -hmm. also founded on professional standards and ethical standards. Yes. Yeah. What, what year was that, 1840? 47, yes. yeah. Yes, but it got reorganized, in, in, the, in the 20th century, it got reorganized and, and actually became an effective uh, credentialing uh, and reforming force. Right. But thank you. <laughs> I'd love to talk to you about the 19th century part as well. Actually, in this process, two different educational movements overlapped, reforming medical schools and organizing specialties. They happened at the same time. The medical profession rose to prominence in the 20th century because its procedural technique as well as its scientific knowledge, hence, hence the importance of surgery and surgeons. And the slide also shows the importance of a third concurrent movement besides educational reform and specialization, and that was licensing as a regulatory factor in, or, or in professionalism. Indeed, the Federation of State Medical Boards licensing boards, and the National Board of Medical Examiners will be coming up to their 100-year anniversaries before too long. So this generate has generated a number of continuing questions. We're still st struggling with what to do about specialty credentials, what to do about the relationship between licensing and between education and licensing and all these other, other things. In 1933, uh, the American Board of Medical Specialties was founded uh, to try to coordinate different uh, actions, independent actions by different boards. And this is, this is the list of the American Board of Medical Specialties approved boards today. So you can see 1933, there were some founder members. And, uh, and by 1991, there are 24 boards, and still 24 boards with numerous specialty examinations and sub now subspecialties. It's an interesting, it's an interesting <coughs> structural uh, organization. So the message of medicine as a self-regulating profession for much of the 20th century was that the best guarantee of quality and public service to American society is high educational standards for medical students and later for residents later in time, uh, over historical time, for residents, first in the specialties and increasingly in the second half of the 20th century through the present, additional training in subspecialties. This policy has created well-trained experts in an increasing number of fields until today virtually every American doctor is board certified uh, uh, and that includes family medicine. Of course, medical school reforms, as uh, Charles Bryan uh, gave a talk uh, recently uh, at, in New York, and he also pointed out that uh, the reforms made medical education extraordinarily expensive, long and expensive. Among the virtues of this educational re uh, uh, approach have been the, the, the powerhouse academic health centers, the focus on science, technology, innovation, and so forth. And uh, for, for really, for most of the time, uh, until the pres recent present, it has been assumed that producing better physicians in terms of skills and knowledge would produce better care. And the ABA, ABMS has a registered trademark, higher standards, better care, which lays it out. But of course, we know that's not enough. <laughs> right? You can have wonderful, wonderful subspecialties and subspecialists, but they're of no use if the right patient doesn't get to see the right, the right doctor at the right time. And 
there are some other funny, funny aspects here too. You know, the, the, the organization of healthcare has gone awry while the organization of specialty production has been like a well-oiled machine. Mm. So, uh, and yet we've known for many, many years, these are not new issues. This is 1933. Medical care rate ranks as a major industry, right? Over a million people were then employed in hospitals. People are, medical personnel are not distributed in, in terms of need. Only a very vast, small minority of consumers can make rational and informed choices. And the growth of specialization is one of the conspicuous features of practice. I thought you might like this. This SS Goldwater was a very a renowned uh, hospital administrator in New York. And this is from 1927. I told you I was focused on the 1920s. The specialist is at, at once the hope and despair of modern medicine. And yet, it, it's, it's broken medicine into groups of skirmishing, skirmishing competitive uh, groups and has made everything very, very much more complicated. And we know that's, that's, that's been known for many years, but it hasn't made any difference. So what about competence? We've, 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 we've looked at defining professions in terms of status, social class, and behavior, etiquette. We've briefly touched on educational credentials and specialization. But what about actual competence? And the, the, this has been a very interesting set of developments because we now have this maintenance of certification program, which is very recent and was very slow to develop. Just how slow, I'll show you very, very quickly. In 1969, the American Board of Family Medicine made cert recertification of its diplomates mandatory. And actually, the, the family physicians have, have been really interesting pioneers on, uh, on uh, measurement of competence. And they've also, they also came out with some kind of worrying uh, data a few years back that showed even that for the, though there was recertification, what, what physicians know tends to tail off over time, uh, over their time of their lives. And so if there's not recertification, one can expect much more tailing off unless there are enormous effects to, do, to, uh, to keep up to date. Of course, in the old model, you're a physician because you're a physician, because you're a member of a social class. It was just assumed that so somebody like that would naturally keep up to date. But that was a, always, a, I think, an, um, an, an unreasonable assumption. So competence. 1972, well, yes, let's have some general guidelines for all the boards. Well, uh, we'll have, yes, we'll adopt some principles about recertification. Here they are, 1975, the years are going by. Nine boards by 1982 have begun administering recertification programs, and it doesn't mean that these are necessarily compulsory. Nine to, but it isn't until 1998 almost 30 years after the family physicians put in uh, required recertification. It wasn't until 1998, in the, and why? Because it was in the middle of the quality movement, in the, in the, uh, uh, in the middle of, uh, of the issuing of the IOM report to Ur is Human, which pointed out uh, the huge numbers of medical errors that could be detected uh, and the, uh, the need for, comp for concentrating on competence. Um, it wasn't until there were alternative ways of measuring physician quality that the professional organizations began to jump in. And this has been a very, very interesting uh, and actually uh, an amazing uh, program to, uh, to provide for new people with new diplomas, not necessarily with the old entrenched whose diplomas are more like degrees, but for new, for new diplomas, um, the, uh, uh, a requirement that there should be an examination 
it should be based on these six competencies we had at the beginning, so it's, it's wider than just um, knowledge and skills. And, um, and that's now in place. It's usually typically, te typically 10 years, to be taken each 10 years. Uh, and, um, and, and generally accepted, although of course there was a lot of grumbling, those who faced re-examination saw it as an unwelcome incursion in their professional role and autonomy, uh, and as an unfair distinction between those with the newer diplomates and those with the older time-unlimited uh, time diplomas. But it was assumed, I think rightly, there are now so many regulators in the healthcare industry that someone else would require doctors to be um, recertified. So that would take care of itself. Okay, now we move into the last gasp uh, here. <coughs> Hope you're still with me. I'm covering an awful lot of ground here. All right, so now we, we are in, uh, j just before we get to the, uh, the, the, the general conclusions, I want to make one more point, and that is uh, how do consumers choose doctors, how do patients choose doctors when you get more and more and more subspecialties. Um, for example, there are now 20 to 24 approved ABMS uh, boards examined in 37 different general areas and in more than 120 subspecialties. Now, some of these subspecialties are the same between boards. But that raises another question, which I don't think anybody's researched yet. Is a patient who can't sleep better off, here's a question for you, is a patient who can't sleep better off going to see somebody who's credentialed in sleep medicine, whose primary field is psychiatry, or neurology, or otolaryngology, or internal medicine, or family medicine, or anesthesiology, right? Or pulmonary, yeah. So, there you go. And, and what about fields <coughs> which are not currently uh, credentialed, like pain medicine, which is, which is now very much, again, once again to the fore? And uh, with only three boards currently have subspecialties in pain medicine. I hope that will, will change. All right, we're back on conclusions again, and then I'll stop. My sum up really is that, that, that professionalism in medicine has multiple limitations, but also multiple ways of multiple definitions, and that these definitions have been around for many, many years, and will continue to be around for many, many years. And with different, with different elements of it uh, emphasized in different periods. And I've, and I've just got these, I think you'll be able to read these. So now, when we're all worried about what it means to be a member of the middle class, let alone the upper middle class, a professional class, a social class, we're all anxious about, uh, about this in uh, uh, current American society. Um, professionalism, then, there have to be other ways for professionalism to earn the respect of, of the professionals in the, uh, in the modern healthcare environment in one way or another. And it's very interesting that during this recent period where, where doctors have been feeling uh, betrayed and, and anxious, the Hippocratic Oath has come back, the white coat ceremonies, different forms of, uh, of, of accrediting for status. So that's number one. I've got six. Number two. Primary reliance on education and professional status went by the boards years ago, and it's yet, yet um, there is still this idea that you know if you want if you want to distribute doctors better, you have to train more of them. We we should have learned in the 1960s and 70s that you don't necessarily redistribute redistribute primary care by training more primary physicians. So there's a long way to go on this one too. Incentives in the healthcare system of long defined working roles, and hence the current focus on teamwork, cooperation, and systems, which should be welcomed. Third, 
The quality movement is a reasonable movement, and it's just taken a long time to come with its rules, records, checklists, reporting, supervisory requirements and measures. Uh, may not be an ideal way of doing it, but the actual, the, actual, the actual quality movement is something which should be applauded. Other occupations where an individual's life is at stake have been working in such environments for years, such as pilots, though. Oh, my daughter, the aircraft mechanic, uh, who, uh, who's always, who signs planes out under her own license and uh, lives by the rules because you have to sign out every single thing. It's not new. It's, it's important. So professionalism is much more than this. And the stated competencies are, though they seem to have downgraded professionalism in, into one of six qualities necessary for the good physician, rather than a description of the whole, that was not the intention of the ABMS and the ACGME in establishing the competencies in the late 1990s. Obviously, one needs all of these aspects to, uh, to produce professionalism writ, whole, writ large. However, I think the categorization of professionalism as one of six competencies has had the useful effect of emphasizing that professional behavior can be learned and taught, and ethics can be learned and taught, uh, that professional demeanor, listening, and empathy are, are essential for communication with patients, health teams, and others, and that ethics lie on a behavioral continuum. So maybe professionalism as a competency will get relabeled or not. It doesn't matter. Um, but uh, I think it's been, it's been a very useful thing to do. Five. Public roles, you can't expect the medical profession to, uh, to change the entire healthcare system. And indeed, I, th I think in some ways one can argue that the history of professionalism through medical organizations has been far more effective than the history of medical care through government or through the private marketplace. So you can't expect a profession. Individuals may wish to, to, to engage fully in reform movements of different kinds, but you can't expect professional organizations to change the system. And the most important public role is being an excellent physician across all of these different categories and to re respond to a changed environment, even though parts of, it, of that environment seem unnecessarily constrictive. The profession has often been slow in the past in acting as a public conscience for medical care, but I think that's changed. I, I feel quite optimistic about the current status of the medical profession and being in it. But last, and perhaps most important, was something I began with is the importance of living in the present. Why do we look back at history? We look back at history because a lot of the, the things that were talked about yesterday are still in our mentality today. And we need really to think clearly about what are the pressures today? What are the values today? What are the values we would like today? Not being ruled by beliefs carried over from other times. And I, this is, was put very nicely by uh, Professor Stanley Fish, and this really says the same thing, only in more elegant language. He's, you know, you may have beliefs, an extension of beliefs that are historically contingent, but they're part of you with the way you think, and yet you hold on to these beliefs and assumptions with an absoluteness that is the necessary consequence of which, of the absoluteness with which they shape us. So, I'm, I, so I come back to the beginning and say, this institute, all of you, all of us who write about the professions and the professionalism, uh, are uh, wise to think, when the times move, it is wise to move with them. <laughs> and that goes for historians too. So thank you. Thank you. Can you take some, can you take some sure, I will, but happily. Professor Stevens' talk is open um, for questions and comments.
you, uh, you began, I think, in a very um, interesting way, noting how um, co competency uh, or professionalism as a competency is a sort of weird, anomalous <laughs> thing. Yeah. Um, and and that, I think that's very interesting. We haven't heard that from anybody else, but I think it's, uh, it is very interesting uh, as an observation. And I wonder if that's not in tension with the sort of second slide, which sort of says, well, basically everything's the, the same, um, you know, the problems are there, uh, people are no better, no worse. But isn't it often the case that um, a law will appear um, and that's a clue that there is some sort of problem or something different in the time in which it appears. Um, and maybe, you know, the appearance of professionalism as a competency would be like that, looking at a law that's passed because there's some sort of problem that it's trying to address. Sure. And if that's the case, what do you think is the problem um, that has led to making professionalism a, a, a competency or giving it all that um, emphasis? Is it, is it just that we're anxious because we feel our uh, middle class status is being taken away from us or something else? I think it has several facets. One, there was this huge anti-professionalism movement from in the 70s, 1970s and 1980s uh, where sociologists discovered uh, to their horror, uh, that uh, professions were actually working only in their own interests. So at least that was, I'm, I'm obviously oversimplifying this for speed. But the professions were actually uh, working for their own interests, uh, both individually, that professional autonomy was a, was, a, was a word which was supposed to give the public great trust, along the old idea that you should trust people because they were doctors. But um, that didn't hold in the modern world of the 1970s and on. And, um, and that, as Paul Starr said, in the early 1980s, the co corporation was coming anyway to wipe professionalism out, uh, particularly to wipe, the, wipe doctors out. So the AMA had been a, uh, 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 I'm sure Paul wouldn't say an evil institution, but a uh, had been a bad influence, let's put it that way. That's what my mother would say, a bad influence, right? And uh, so, uh, so there was this, this, this backlash, and there was true, um, true demoralization in, in medicine because the corporations were coming. Actually, the insurance companies were coming. Hospitals were getting together, but also in the insurance were com companies were coming, and then we had managed care in the 1990s which threatened to, uh, uh, which did try to regulate doctors in ways they, they weren't willing to be regulated. And a, an enormous amount of, of demoralization, um, partly because uh, it, it was not such, um, it was not such a, a preferred profession to be in, in the sense that real incomes began to go, to began to decline. I haven't looked at the recent in income figures, but you probably have and that there didn't seem to be the same public trust, et cetera, et cetera. Whole, so I think demoralization is a way of looking at that, that. And as Stanley Fish said, because he's talking about anti-professionalism um, in the 1980s, that, um, that, that now that, 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 that you, have an, you have professionalism, then you have anti-professionalism, and then you need a new professionalism, to, uh, to be able to reestablish uh, in new conditions or whatever you can reestablish. And I think that's what's happening now. Uh, I, I, I just want to enter into this discussion. I, I'm sorry, um, Dr. Winnie left be, because I, in, in the mid 80s, around the time that uh, Professor Starr w was writing his book, um, I, I heard a, an executive director of the AMA, which of course is headquartered here in, in mm. Chicago, um, say that during his tenure, which was just starting his 10 or 12 years in the role of executive director, he intended, he intended to make professionalism and ethics uh, his calling card. Mm. Um, that it was a way to regain the allegiance and support of the public, that it um, it would be an argument against narrow economic self-interest. Mm -hmm. um, it would affirm a set of values 
that I had not actually seen, but, but that go back a, a long way. Um, and, um, and it would recapture a, a kind of um, idealism for medicine that he thought uh, had pretty much gone out of it. Mm -hmm. That depends on how you say what I just said. It can sound really nasty and narrowly self-serving. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually didn't take it to be like that. Sure. As he was, um, I mean, this was his platform, um, laying out what he intended to accomplish in, in his next 10 years. Um, and I don't think he did that individually, but I, but I think those were the years that saw this reemergence of, of uh, this new lofty claims of professionalism that, that led to our seminar. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's a marketing strategy. There's nothing wrong with a marketing, a marketing strategy no. if it does something good. Yeah, I, I think and you think you're saying he believed that Yeah, I think he thought of it as more than just marketing, yes. but, but there, was an, <laughs> there yes. was an element mm -hmm. of, of marketing, even marketing the reputation and, and status uh, of the physician based on a commitment to ethical and professional ideals, N not unlike that original code of the AMA sure. or, or the early years of the 20th century. Yes. I, I liked how you brought in the dimension of etiquette mm -hmm. and manners. Um, that was quite, quite interesting to reflect on. And um, it seems to me that it raises this question of the role of, of trust Right, because I think it's sort of this etiquette and manners that cre can create trust, right, in the profession to do the right thing. Because there's there's a scientific authority, um, and I think that's always been. I mean, that as you kind of traced out in the early part of the 20th century, that's that's sort of been the modus operandi of the AMA and the medical profession from the very beginning. Right. That we have scientific authority, and mm -hmm. you can trust us because we have the scientific authority. But at some point that sort of scientific authority only goes so far, right? There is the, the manner, the mannerisms and etiquette and the kind of the bedside manner, right? And, the, and also I think the moral and the ethics, the sense that if a, a poor, impoverished person comes into our doors, we will take care of them, yeah. right? And okay. that, so, and, and it seems to me on those dimensions, there's, there's sort of, much less agreement. So you, you mentioned the the mm -hmm. specialists and subspecialists and, mm -hmm. and 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 potentially fragmentation there, right? I think definitely fragmentation. Sure. But also this sort of running history of um, academic physicians, physicians in public health, and then private practice physicians, which also seems to be important fragmentation that happens around this sort of trying to create professionalism writ, writ large. Mm -hmm. and, and so I just wonder if you, if you, what you think about that. Do you also see that as an as a area of fragmentation, area that kind of breaks down this notion of a professionalism writ large? I, I hope things are moving beyond that into, because you, you, it's very, almost everybody needs other people at this point in, in professions, whether you, whether you need people in other professions, other, other health professions to work with, or you need to have good referral networks, or, or prefer preferably you're actually working in an organization with people in different fields. So it's, so it's fun. And you, you're always learning from other people, and uh, as well as giving very good patient care. You left out one thing, which I think has become extraordinarily important and central, and that's judgment. Because patients can go to the internet, and they can look up all sorts of stuff these days, so you need to have a judge, a, 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 a doctor, the patient will trust, who can say, all right, you've got these, the, the, these three alternatives. Uh, these are the advantages, disadvantages, this, 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 and this. And the patient says, which would you do? You know, and this is prepared to argue for one. I, I think judgment has become a core issue of professionalism in medicine today at all levels, and, and that can cope with information technologies that can cope with patients coming in um, uncertain and or coming in with Google references and so forth. Um, I wanted to call on Jack. Jack, please. <laughs> when I walked in this building today, I had a rather striking realization because I 
hadn't actually thought about the fact that it is exactly 50 years since I was an intern in this place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and uh, I think maybe I was trying to think back as to what was professionalization 50 years ago. And it was two things. It was a total responsibility for the patient. The intern had a fiduciary responsibility for the patient. And there was no time limit. Now, I personally feel people do get tired, mm -hmm. but in 50 years ago, the system here was that you were on one out of four nights, but on the other three nights, and I didn't know that till I came because I was quite poor and I actually couldn't make the trip Yale to here to find this out till I arrived. On the other three nights, you were expected to be here till 11. <laughs> <laughs> and then just one other thing about this fiduciary thing. At uh, one point, I had a patient who came in late in the day. Nobody knew what was wrong with the patient. And uh, in the middle of the night, I suddenly woke up and realized what the problem was. I looked a couple of blocks away and ran to the hospital and started treating the patient for Addison's disease, which nobody had thought about, just started the treatment immediately. In those days, patients stayed in the hospital till they were better, actually well. Sort of an amazing concept, <laughs> actually. And this man said very little. He was a man of few words. But as he left this hospital, he turned to me and he said, Doc, if you ever want somebody rubbed out, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I should just comment that this was a major win for me in a particular bureaucratic article. The highest I had compliment. In place. Yes. <laughs> but this is a great, great institution. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I truly love the University of Chicago and this entire uh, enterprise is. Mm -hmm. I think characterized by the fact that more than almost any institution I know, Chicago is a place where you can ask a question without actually knowing the answer. <laughs> it's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful place. So yeah. congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, with that wonderful statement, um, I, I, I did want the, um, you know, we have a new program with the Veterans Administration um, in which the Veterans Administration does a national search each year and identifies three candidates of extraordinary merit, and then they come and, and do our ethics fellowship for the year. I see two of them here, Teal Keltner and John, John Wig. Um, and, um, but but uh, your, your new book is on the Veterans Administration. Yes, is it I'm, not? I'm looking at the, I started by why do we have a Veterans Administration, which was founded in 1921, <coughs> then called the Veterans Bureau, then there was a big uh, scandal associated with setting it up in the early years. So I'm writing about the beginning of the Veterans, of the ve the veterans Administration in the 1920s and what happened. It's a really interesting story to me. I hope it's going to be interesting oh, yeah. to you too. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming. And John, thank you.